The by Sandra Raines de Busque. Preface. It began with the new batch of virus, a variant virus, made by our government and meant for the enemy. It was a new strain of flu, never known by man, a souped-up, modified killer flu virus. Scientist Roy Stikes Jr. created this super flu, and he also caused the spread of it. One day, per the usual, everyone was going about their business, working, raising kids, dropping kids off at school, picking them up, cooking dinner, going to games, movies, picnics, getting married, divorced. Engaged. The next day, we were all fighting for our lives. Chapter One, Building Thirteen. Jada sat at her desk in front of the window overlooking the center of the city in Hayshire Mid City. She felt lucky to have been offered this position, but she also felt guilty for betraying her best friend. Who had tried so hard to gain this position for herself? No, she couldn't and wouldn't dwell on that. Jada swirled her chair around, facing her large marble desk. She looked at all the space she had now compared to the small space she'd had before today, and she looked at and relished all the little gadgets gifted to her today. On her first day in this new office, God, she was so lucky. There was a knock on her door, and Jada hurriedly patted her hair down and smoothed out the front of her blouse before calmly inviting whoever it was to enter. Yes, come in. A tall, skinny, middle-aged man dressed in a nice, expensive suit opened the door with an air of ease. Hello, Miss Kendall. My name is Eric Tommy, and I'm here to help you get yourself situated and answer any questions you might have concerning your job requirements. He said this mouthful as he pulled out the chair opposite her and her desk, and gracefully seated himself, staring at her for a response. Oh, well, thank you, Mister Tommy. I'm not sure what questions I have yet, but I'll be sure to ask for you if I get in a pickle. Jada tried to sound just as smooth and graceful as he had, but she felt it had all come out in some terrible slang of Spanish somehow. She sat still and tried to keep her posture while staring at him and waiting for his response to her response. She didn't think it would come any time soon, and her nerves were wavering. Is there anything else? She decided to break the silence. Mr. Tommy stared at her a moment longer and vaguely looked around her office, as if he were secretly inspecting it. No, there's nothing else, Miss Kendall. I'll be close by if you do need me. With that said, he stood up, nodded to her, and walked out of the office, softly closing her door behind him. Jada let out a long-held breath. This was not going to be easy. She could just feel it. The Rand Ranch. It was a beautiful place with open fields, a small barn, a wishing well, and picnic tables that lined the yard close to the house under the shade trees. The house had been built in nineteen o one by slaves. That were given three square meals a day, a decent housing. Mister Rand was a fair man, even for a white man. His wife Lucinda had dementia and could not remember anything but how to cook, and cook wonderful meals she did. She made up meals that only kings were entitled to, and she dished out platefuls. To every slave and their children before she made her own and her husband's plates. 
She insisted that the slaves be allowed to eat at the picnic tables and front porch on the swing. Lucinda had always been a good woman, and George Rand was a good man. Other white folk shook their heads in disgust at how Lucinda fussed over the slaves, but Lucinda just laughed at them and reminded them about what the good Lord demanded of his shepherds. And then she'd go about her business cleaning and doing laundry right alongside her female slaves that she called her friends. Lori shook her head. She'd been daydreaming again. Seemed to her that she did all that time now. She sipped her tea as she sat on the front porch on the swing that was here for years and years. Yes, it was beautiful here, and she so appreciated being able to buy it for herself and her young son. He was twelve years old now, and this was the life he needed. He needed calm and space and peace, the same things she herself needed. Their driveway was every bit of three thousand feet long, and it was somewhat winding, too which made it an even more interesting drive up to the house. Nathan loved it here. He loved everything about it. Sometimes she couldn't keep track of him, but she didn't worry because this was one of the safest places in Nevada. She had learned the history on this old homestead prior to moving in, and Nathan had asked many questions prior, but... No more questions after he had seen the place the first time. He had begged her to buy it, and had made so many promises of how he would help her with all the housework and yard work. She laughed to herself, just remembering his excitement. Granted, Nathan had kept his promises. Building 13 You would think with as many people that worked in this building, that there would be more noise, but it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Building 13 was, in every sense of the word, the one building where you did not want to work, and if you did by some chance work here, you could kiss your ass goodbye if anything at all went wrong. Kiss your ass goodbye, but not in the way that you think. It's not by being fired, no, it's death. You simply die. Here at Building 13, we make chemicals and viruses for war. We make some of the scariest killers that you could ever imagine. We have some that will kill you instantly and cause such agony for mere seconds that it feels like you've been suffering for days right before you claim your peace. We have some that take hours to kill you and the pain that they inflict is unimaginable torture. We have some that might take weeks to kill you, and those show little effects until the last hour or two. The point is, is that everything we make here kills you, and there is no help from anyone anywhere. You cannot leave this place if an accident occurs. You stay here until you die, and then they burn you downstairs in the crematorium. Each person has their own room that they work in. Each room is used for each creation. You suit up and punch in your code, and you enter and begin your day of destruction. You cannot leave this room until someone, a guard, lets you out by punching in a different code only known to them two minutes before your shift ends. That way, they can have time to monitor your room before allowing you to exit it. It is your job to listen for the alarm that lets you know it's time to enter the decontamination chamber directly to the left of the room, still in the room. You are then let out of the chamber through an exit door not in your personal workroom. After all is said and done, the main attraction here is Roy Stikes Jr. 
Roy is 42 years old and has been working in Building 13 for 16 years. He is single and has no children. His parents have passed long ago, and he has one brother who he hasn't seen in 16 years. He, with his life history, was ideal for this job. No outside ties to speak of. This is what the company preferred. The government was simply obnoxious that way. After Roy decontaminated himself per orders of higher-ups, he could clock out and leave Building 13 and go home. He let out a deep breath daily as he walked out of the building. He thanked God immediately that he could leave Building 13. Church And God said, Let there be light. Pastor Abe, a middle-aged, native-looking man, always began with the same verse, but the crowd, if you can call ten people a crowd, loved that verse, and he accommodated them with their favorites, always. To the left of the altar was an old piano that sometimes sounded out of tune, but no one seemed to mind. To the right of the altar was several fish tanks, which held dozens of live snakes. None were poisonous, of course. The snakes were mainly just for appearances and rituals, to show faith and awe. After thirty minutes of versing God's word, Pastor Abe closed his Bible and bowed his head. His followers followed suit, and each bowed their heads in prayer. Dear Lord in heaven, we come to you today as sinners and ask that you give us a holy new birth. Amen. You could hear the amens in the crowd, some louder than others, depending on each one's faith. It's that time, my brothers and sisters. If you will all stand and create a circle, I would appreciate it. Pastor Abe motioned to his regular snake handler, Josh. If you will do the honors, Josh. Josh, a much younger black man, nodded his head in acceptance and walked to the farthest tank on his right. He looked back at Abe and Abe motioned for him to go to the third one over instead. Josh did so. He opened the lid of the tank and without further ado, he reached in and pulled out the snake. Pass it around, Josh. Let everyone feel the power that God Almighty has over the serpent. Orphanage Leela walked the halls with her hands tucked firmly behind her back. Click clunk went her old woman heels with each step in the ever so quiet hallway. In this orphanage resided 62 orphans and the ages ranged anywhere from six months to sixteen years. Boys and girls. Boys on floor one and girls on floor two. There was thirty-two bedrooms per floor and then they had a nurse's station and cafeteria, a rec room, restrooms per floor and of course an office. In the basement they had a holding room for any child that might pass away for one reason or another. One call to the district coroner's office, and the child would be picked up promptly. A throaty cough caught Leela's attention immediately, and she turned. A stern look on her face, half expecting one of the teenagers to need something they couldn't have. She was quickly corrected when she saw it was instead the orphanage director. Gathering her wits about her, she smiled. Yes, sir? The director didn't like Leela, but no one wanted to work in an orphanage anymore. No one seemed to like kids these days. Miss Hampson, have you any idea what time it is? Leela's eyes widened. No, sir, I do not. The director shook his head as if he was aware of that. It's time for the children to be in bed and then... After taken care of, you need to clock out and go home and get some needed rest yourself. Leela cleared her own scratchy throat. <clears> throat> I see, sir. 
Of course. With that, she turned on her clickety clickety heels and marched to door one on floor one. Tapping on the door once, she waited momentarily and opened it. It's time for bed. She shut the door and walked to door number two. This went on for sixty-two doors, and by the time she was finished, it was like every other time. She was so tired, she couldn't wait to go home. As Leela was clocking out, the three regular guards buzzed themselves in. They had night shift, and Leela was so glad she herself didn't have it. She had rituals to carry on: a bath, coffee, late night with Daryl. A talk show host on the television, and then sleep.